Hello and welcome to Sharp HR Career Corner with Karen Sharp Price. This podcast will inform and inspire you in your quest to find the right career path. If you're just starting out, looking to make a change in your field or transitioning into a new career, then this podcast is for you. We will be sharing tips and providing resources on topics such as writing resumes, interviewing, using LinkedIn, and networking. We will take a look at different careers, companies, and opportunities. You will hear success stories from professionals in all career paths, and so much more. You will leave this podcast with three key takeaways that you can easily put into practice. Enjoy! Welcome to Sharp HR Career Corner. I'm Karen Sharp Price. Today, we're going to talk to Mark Duggan from Mark Duggan Photography about his career story. Mark and I met through Grow Buffalo Business. We haven't officially talked until today, but I have seen him at different uh, virtual events through Grow. Grow was a group created during the pandemic to help small business owners during difficult times. Hi, Mark. How are you doing today? I'm excellent. How are you today? Happy birthday, by the way. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> it's so funny. Sometimes you have a birthday where nobody knows the whole day, and it's kind of like, eh, that didn't feel like a real birthday. Today, I, it has been a nonstop day, and everybody I run into, it warms the cockles of the heart on a very cold day. <laughs> well, I hope it's been a, a good day so far and, and finishes up on a, on a good note as well. Sure, they will. I've been following you uh, since actually I've seen you on Grow. I've been following you on LinkedIn and I've been really impressed with your work. Like that is why I've, I've asked you to be a guest and, and I'm very grateful that you've agreed to be on my podcast because I've got a lot of questions I want to ask you. So um, I think that this is going to be a, a fun uh, interactive <laughs> podcast for both of us. Um, I appreciate the compliments and the invite on having me come here. Um, you, you might have bitten off more than you could chew. I'm, I'm a little bit of a petty <laughs> Well, we'll see how it goes. I can always edit. <laughs> sure. So if you're ready, let's, let's jump right in. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. So let's start back your pre-college days, um, Fredonia. What made you decide to go to Fredonia um, and specifically go towards a degree, a degree with Bachelor of Fine Arts in Sculpture? Um, so I didn't choose to go to Fredonia. I actually choose to go to SUNY Purchase first. I was only there about a semester. I had no idea what I was doing. I had zero goals, zero aspirations. I just knew that everybody was going to college. Actually, I took a year off after high school before going to college. And when my friends all really went to college, I was like, oh, shoot, this is a really, this is a thing that we're all doing. Okay, I'll, I'll get on board. Um, and I had a buddy who was going to school at SUNY Purchase, which is out by New York City. And he said, great music scene, great arts. Um, you're, you know, half an hour from the city. And I was like, that's what I want to do. And I got out there and with zero goals and aspirations, it makes it really hard to be away from home. My oh. dad was sick at the time. You know, there was a girl at home. And so that was what, after one semester at SUNY Purchase, which had a great arts program, mind you, ended up landing me back at Fredonia. The girl was back at Fredonia. That was an hour from home where my dad was, uh, which was super important to me. Like I realized by leaving how important family was. So then at Fredonia, again, zero goals, zero aspirations, just kind of bouncing around, happy to have a girlfriend, happy to be near my family. And my dad actually ended up passing away. Oh, and I happened to be taking visual arts courses. And so I was in like sculpture one. It was like, you just needed an arts course to get through the program or whatever and my dad passed away it was lung cancer and stuff and there was a very simple 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 project where it was like build something out of anything that kind of makes you think differently about that thing so people did weird things like fill sinks with eggs or uh put paint into a um a soap dispenser instead of you know what i mean like just kind of screwed around i I'm a procrastinator by, na by nature. And uh, my idea was to build an entire man out of cigarettes and then burn it. Um, and the professor was like, don't do that. He's like, that's way too ambitious. Like, you're the guy with no goals. Just stick with that. Dumb it down, dummy. And that just made me angry. And he, great guy. Ended up building this thing. It became like a tribute to my dad. It became like a way to move on. It became like this big visual journal. It became a way for me to hang out with him when he couldn't be there. And that was that was it. It landed it for me. I was like, wow. 
I realized I needed different forms of communication to process things. And so from there it was dabbling everything. I learned to weld, I learned more about photography, I learned, you know, digital arts and stuff like that. That's a, that's a great story <laughs> inside of a story. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I want to take one step back. How was taking a year off between high school and college? Was that a good move looking back? Ooh, I didn't do anything interesting with it. I'm very big on feeling that any additional perspective you can give yourself good or bad is worth getting. Cause it kind of gives you different reference points to figure out how you should operate in the world. And I worked, I was like, working in a restaurant. I had like 14 jobs at one time. I was like working in a restaurant and I was stocking shelves at Home Depot and watching my friends continue to grow and realize like the people around me in those work worlds were not continuing to grow. And I was like, ah, I'm more that than I am this. So Mm -hmm. if anything, it was a nice kick in the keister to keep on moving. Did you know at that time, did you have any idea what you might follow, what you might pursue? Zilch. No, okay. I, I just, uh, <laughs> even in high school, took a ton of photography. We still had like a film studio back then and like the, the dark room and all that. Um, I pretty much only played with a camera back then because I thought I looked cute maybe with like having the camera around my neck or <laughs> I, yeah, I'm historically, I'm becoming more and more focused, but I just like to bounce around. I'm, I'm like that squirrel dog, <laughs> kind of who I am. So it took yeah. a while to get there. All right. Well, then I think that you've probably got another story because this next question really intrigued me when I started looking into what you've done. So after graduating, three years later, you joined the Peace Corps. Where does that come from? Dodging student loans? <laughs> uh, I know. Um, well, what, so what, again, what were you doing those three years and then, and then what made you decide? Yeah. Um, so... I graduated, graduated with a degree in sculpture. Neat, very useful. Um, and then I needed a job. And so I worked simultaneously, I believe, at a collection agency. Um, I was cleaning an office at night. And then I ended up getting a job at the school for extremely troubled children. Um, and they were middle school through high school. Um, and the things that I realized during that period, again, it's all about perspective, is I don't want to work three jobs for the rest of my life. Um, I was having problems even with all that still paying my college loans. Uh, But I did realize that even though the school was extremely difficult to work with, like it's like, instead of having parent teacher days, you have like learn how to wrestle each other to the ground days. Um, And I mean, it was love, love, love the kids from that experience they're there because they're challenging. Like you, I would go into work like having a heart attack before the kids even showed up some days. And um, I know I can angle the camera however I want. I'm like two feet tall. I was the smallest person in the building. I was constantly getting beat up. Oh my Um, God. But so, sorry, told you, Chatty Kathy. From all that I learned um, and I knew that I liked to travel. I had traveled in the past um, to visit family who lives in Europe. I was in a band for a while and we went all around the States. I knew I loved to travel and I knew from working at this school that I did like working with kids who needed extra help, extra legs up in the world. Um, And a good, good, good buddy of mine that knows me better than myself suggested the Peace Corps. He's like, do some good, see the world, learn a language um, and come back with a little bit more perspective again. So that's what gave me the boot out of the States. Wow. So now how long were you in the Peace Corps? Um, just shy of four years. Uh, wow, typically it was, it was, yeah. You want me to just jump into it? Yeah. I mean, what, yeah. what experience did you, did you get from that? What, um, yeah. um, so typical, typical contract or not contract, um, commitment, I guess that Peace Corps asks is 27 months. You go to a country that generally back then you didn't really get to choose. You just kind of got thrown something. I got the Philippines. Um, Thank you. And, uh, and you land there. And then the first three months is all training, which it's all perspective. Like they were training us on everything from how to eat with your host family, the foods that they eat to seeing some of the wildest communities in, in terms of like, um, like food scarcity or, uh, just financial dire straits seeing that perspective, um, and then learning to work with organizations who help people in those situations. So that's the first three months. And then the next two years, 
they place you with an organization that you volunteer with. They placed me for my first two years. <laughs> I was so disappointed and this sounds so stupid and so shallow. They placed me at a beautiful orphanage on a beautiful island with white sand beaches and 100 degree weather every day and 200 of the happiest, cutest little kids. Oh my gosh. And it was amazing. It was amazing. And I loved every minute of it. And I still literally, you know, today's my birthday, um, got more Facebook messages from people in the Philippines than I did in the States. Wow. And it will be that way for the rest of my life, I'm sure of it. Um, but it was so easy. Like they landed me this layup of a job where they're like, can you make these kids happy? I'm like, they already are, but I'll play with them for two years. Oh. And so during that time, like we did like community outreach and we um, tried to like build some small uh, farms and stuff like that. But basically the two year commitment ended and my Peace Corps boss uh, reaches out to me, says, oh, are you really going home? I was like, yeah, like it's been two years. I miss my family. I miss chicken finger subs. Like I'm ready to go home. He's like, okay. I just thought that, uh, thought you wanted a challenge. And I was like, okay, I'll bite. What do you got for me? Uh, he had made connections with this organization in Manila, which I do not have many nice things to say about that place, the capital of the Philippines, where they were trying to work with a community of 10,000, which it's probably grown since then, 10,000 squatters who had moved into a cemetery and taken over the tombs and the mausoleums and made homes out of those because the streets were overcrowded. Oh my God. Folk. And it was shelter. It, I mean, they have crazy rain seasons there and stuff like that. So it was, it was shelter. So wow. they, the people that lived in there, they would actually form a relationship with the family who owned the mausoleum and the people that, you know, it's reside there, how are you gonna put it? Where we live in your mausoleum, we'll keep it clean, we'll keep it painted, we'll keep it respected and make sure nobody kind of tramples on it. And wow. insane perspective for me. Quick anecdote. Yeah. Yeah, okay, cool, <laughs> cool, cool. Got cool. One. <laughs> I, oh man, I don't wanna take too much of your time. After that but, one, no. Uh, okay. So, so, cause I'm still not even through my whole four years there. Yeah. So while I'm working with this, um, this group, um, the organization that they paired me with, it was kind of, they were still figuring out how they wanted this to work. The, the goal was to get kids from that community back into school. So it could kind of be like a trickle down. Like if we make the young kids more educated about possibilities that are out there and programs and stuff like that, hopefully as it goes down in age, um, they can educate their parents and their kids will get better. Anyway. I'm teaching a class in this mausoleum, ginormous mausoleum. <laughs> my language skills are extremely limited because every island basically is a different language. So for my first two years, I now have to learn a different language and try to teach them somehow about government programs. Okay. Wow. Um, we go outside and we're like sharing a snack and taking a break because my brain is like already exploding. And the kid says, I live in the base or used to live in the basement of this mausoleum. I was like, there's a basement to the mausoleum. I didn't even know that that was a thing. No. And he points through and the whole thing, maybe like 50 feet by 50 feet is filled with bones, floor to ceiling, 10 feet tall. Um, I was like, oh my gosh, what is going on? And he says, in the other mausoleums where everybody lives, if you, uh, if the family of the dead person basically doesn't pay the rent on the mausoleum somebody comes and takes their bones out and puts them in this place it's like a garbage dump oh my for god family members. so this kid is telling me this and i'm just like whoa that's crazy and i'm like looking at human skulls through this little door wow. and i say but this wasn't here when you lived here was it and he was like oh 100 like we lived with that and he's like they called me uncle mark he's like uncle mark you still don't get it we go back up into the mausoleum and the kids didn't tell me that like when I was pulling pages out of my notebook and throwing them out into garbage bags that were in there, he opened up the garbage bags. Each of those was filled with people too all oh around. My it just goodness. perspective, perspective, perspective. I was just yeah. floored that I could be so far removed from his experience and him from mine. It just blew my mind. And that's, that is that kid's reality every day every day since he's been born. Um, so very, very long answer to you. Oh, and then, and then, I'm sorry. No, that's fine. I'm getting ready to come home again because this is exhausting. Like seeing the way that these kids live is exhausting. Trying to, it was all exhausting. The yeah. Manila is very, very 
ugly place in a lot of ways. Um, and beautiful place, made some great friends. Uh, you guys gotta cover your, your butt, right? Um, I'm getting ready to go home because I'm so, so tired. And a hurricane hits the first community that I lived in, those first three months oh, where I was training. Yeah. And I'm reading news reports where they're just like, everybody estimated dead, like 20 foot tidal wave, yeah. nobody left. And I'm thinking of the orphanage, I'm thinking of like my host family, everybody. Um, and so I extended again, Peace Corps actually created a new position for me just to have a reason for me to go down there. And this is when I really picked up my camera. They said, you can go, you can be a nice guy like you are, you can have a lot of energy like you do, but you have to actually do something this time. Um, and so they hooked me up with another organization where I went down with my camera and I documented all of the different damage in certain ways and to like government buildings or hospitals and things like that send that information, those images to this organization and they would send money and engineers back and fix it all up. And I was like, again, mind blown. My camera can do this? Like I thought yeah. that this was the thing that made me look cute in high school, you know? Um, wow, that is unbelievable. So, so before you went back to where you started, how long had you been there? Total in the Philippines? Three years. Wow, and you, you'd never come home in those three years? I did once. That was a fun surprise for my family. They didn't know I was coming. Um, when I extended for that tough Manila position, the one that my boss suckered me into, basically the deal is like, if you take on something hard for a long time, we'll send you home for a week. Oh, so okay. it, was, it was a fun Christmas that my family didn't plan on having me home, but there it was. Oh my gosh. That, yeah. that is, I mean, we don't look at what we have here in America and appreciate uh, uh, you know, just the simple, just the very simple things that we have in our lives. Wow. That's an amazing story. So, so you come home. Um, now you've got experience with actually taking a lot of probably you took a lot of pictures while you're, um, what, like, what do you do? You, you set foot on American ground now and you're back. Um, what was your next step after that? After experiencing um, all of that, like your worlds have to come back together again now and figure out was, what to do. It was tough. I don't really talk about this very often. It was really tough. First few months back, you go from being, and I think most Peace Corps kids would say this, or adults too, uh, you go from being like everybody's most interesting friend who's doing good for people and you're out there saving the world and change learning languages and stuff to being the homeless guy on somebody's couch it was mm -hmm. such a transition and so i was lucky my, my family took me in for a few months while i figured out because i had just been volunteering for four years basically yeah um and uh yeah they took me in and i mean not took me in i wasn't homeless or anything like that but i uh, I lived with family for a few months and then I got a job bartending for a few months, um, uh, closer to a year. And it was during that time, like you said, the appreciation thing, like realizing how the rest of the world lives. Yeah. I was like, oh, I can play with my camera. It could be kind of a hobby that makes me money sometimes. And while I figure it out, I thought maybe I would become a teacher again or something like that. Mm -hmm. I was like, but while I figure it out, cause that's fun, I'll bartend and it's fun and it's social and I can get to know people again in the area. Oh. When people don't know about how the rest of the world works and they're like i asked for seven ice cubes in my beverage sir i was like this is not the world for me <laughs> like this yeah. is not a fit anymore um i can imagine so, that transition would be really it would be really difficult yeah from going to feeling super useful to not to not making money and feeling good about it to literally like a bartending job is like here's your drink. Thank you for the money. And I was like, oh, that feels dirty every time. And so I did that for a while. And I had, uh, I found a really amazing girlfriend who I'm still with and um, came home one day and was grouchy about how good I used to be and how not good I am. And she's like, cool, quit your job. I'm like, oh, well, I do. She's like, you're going to make a business out of this camera thing. Like it's, wow. it's time to hustle. She's like, if I come home and you're sitting on the couch, it's back to the bar with you. <laughs> Which, which I do pretty well in the bar scene anyway. Um, but So it was her uh, idea. It was, yeah, it was, it was probably something, you know, I had mentioned and played with and toyed with, but yeah, she said, hustle, make it work. That is, that is unbelievable. So, so that's, that's a lot to take in because I, I can, I mean, I can't, I can imagine parts of it, but I can't imagine the feeling that you had 
with what you just experienced and then coming back to um, privilege. And, you know, we are, uh, the majority of us are, um, as long as we have a place to stay and food on the table, we're considered privileged in many countries. Okay. So that that's that's something. Just on that note, I want to take a quick break and I want to have a fun round of sharp get to the point series of fast questions. So it's a little pun on my name, but I'm going to um, ask you some really quick questions. You just answer them and we'll get right to the point. Are you ready for this? Nervous, but ready. <laughs> it, they're very simple. Uh, so virtual or in person? Oh, <laughs> I'm supposed to be faster than this already. <laughs> oh, I'm enjoying virtual. I am too. I, I am. It has a lot I, of benefits. Yeah, I'm going to, I know I'm not supposed to do this, but quick caveat. Virtual for the things like this and the networking, obviously the nature of my business, please in person. I need yes, your face. That, that's absolutely true. Okay. Maybe a, an easier one. Pizza or wings? Pizza. Okay. Social media of choice. Instagram. It's got to be perfect for you because it's all pictures. I mean, majority of it is showing your story. Uh, dog or cat? Dog. Okay. Relaxation of choice. Reading. Yeah, I think so. All right. And then books or music? Oh, music. Really? Okay. Um, now, here's one for you, specifically for you. Black and white or color photography? Oh, you're good at this. You're very good at this. <laughs> Color. I, I will go color. Yeah. Photo or video? Photo. Yeah. Okay. Uh, choice of beverage? <laughs> um, <laughs> right now, rum and coke. Okay. Well, that's what I want. All right. Uh, phone call or email? Um, email, usually. Yeah. You did great. Uh, see, it Thank was you. painless. <laughs> <laughs> it just gives us a chance to kind of, you know, get to know you in a very quick way and, and about different, uh, different interests that you have. So now we're going to switch gears again, and we're going to go back into just some regular questions. When you started your own business, what type of clients did you have or were you looking for are you zeroing in on uh i was looking for nothing that is that is one of the things that i've learned is you need to look for business and it took me a while to realize that like i thought that just being a nice guy with a camera that was easy to work with and low rates was the way to go uh it turns out that is not the way to run a successful business but so i fell into um when i was working at that bar one of the first big constant clients I got was a real estate agent, another bartender that I was working with who did real estate during the day. And for three, four years, I 70% of my business was taking pictures of the inside of homes, making tiny little bungalows look like mansions and making mansions uh -huh. look like something belongs on HGTV. Yep. Yep. So, you know, like we've all been touched by this pandemic um, and it has affected all of our businesses in, in some way, and we've had to pivot in some ways. How has the pandemic changed your clientele or your focus? In my favorite way. Okay, so I like to say that I'm here to help people tell their stories. I'm a chatty Kathy, but I also do like to listen. Um, usually I'm doing much more of the question asking. So I'm here to tell people stories, whether it's about their business or about their family or what senior year looks like to them or their band, whatever. I'm here to tell your story by listening and by showing images off that represent you well. For about six months, I just literally couldn't see people. And I had actually, this came from the real estate thing. Previously, I had shot a home for a older couple who had to downsize. When I took pictures of their house and they sold it, they ended up approaching me again and they said, can you come to our house? Can you set up a studio in our living room and photograph all of our favorite things because we need to sell them in order to, downs in order to downsize. Oh, wow. So this was grandparents' journals. This was plate collections from travels. This was matchbooks, whatever. Um, and it just, but when I realized I couldn't see people anymore, 
this is a whole different world that I've entered and it's been so much fun. So what I do is I photograph family heirlooms, the stuff that usually gets relegated to the back of a closet or in the attic or in the basement, the things that you love, the things that belong to the people that you love, but they don't really like belong safely in the world of like kids running around or in your office space or whatever. Yeah. I photograph them with the love and care of, you know, the most loved and cared thing that you have and then turn into giant beautiful prints for your home, for your office, um, reintroducing those people back into your life. So it's something that I've been sitting on for a couple of years and this was just like, all right, let's let's throw this one on the iron and see how it goes. And it's, it's such been, a cool idea. I mean, I love it. yeah, it's a cool idea. Now, do you always go into someone else's space or do you bring the stuff to yours? Not usually. I usually ask folks to come to me or some people have shifted even if it's closed space because when COVID was a little bit heavier and scarier, the whole point was I was trying to develop a contactless business. Um, so they can mail, we could even like set up FedEx to go to your house and things like that if that's what works best. And uh, it, it's been interesting. It's been interesting being led into people's lives and stories in a completely different way than I would have anticipated before. Yeah, that is a very unique idea. With most of my work, I think of it as being service oriented. You come to me, I send you a digital file for your LinkedIn headshot or whatever. This is something I really like to think of more as a product. Like I want to make sure that it's printed on the best paper. I can connect you with framers if, you know, you feel comfortable with that and stuff like that. Sure. I, I want to be able to hand people a thing, which is another thing that I miss. The one of the reasons I ran away from the real estate thing it was great. I mean, they were like the one industry that was still going, uh, sorry, going during COVID, right? Um, I could have kept on working, but A, it didn't feel safe. And B, where was I going with that? <laughs> um, I kind of oh, lost its excitement. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, 100%. I don't know if it ever had excitement. It was just money. It was, it was really good money. Ah, oh, shoot, where was I going? It became very transactional. It became very there's a key under the mat, you go take the pictures, get me the files by morning, I'll Venmo you money. And I'm like, I'm a people person, like I want that interaction. Yeah. Um, and so that is one of the goals also with this project of mine is I handle the things that you love. I love them like you love them. I photograph them so you can continue to love them. Um, and then I hand you something in the end as well. That's, that, that is really a very unique um, idea that I think is, is going to take off if it hasn't already for you. Because I think that lots of people, I mean, there's just so many people that you can go to and reach out to that would it be interested in that. Yeah, it doesn't have to be morbid either. Like, it's no. funny, a lot of the things that I've gotten have been from family members that have passed away and stuff like that. But I mean, it could be, you know, your son graduates from high school and he was a high school football star, but he's not doing football in college. Like, get his helmet photographed or his jersey in some interesting way. So I, I just, I think it's a fun and interesting and challenging way to honor not just people, but also times that have. Yeah. Kind of um, so, you know, I, I hear your story, you in high school graduate, not sure what you want to do, um, take a year off, watch your friends kind of life go past you, um, think, hey, I got to jump back on and, and get with the picture and get with the, the game there. Um, go out, go to college, get your degree, trying to still figure out what you want to do, join the Peace Corps, have a, an amazing opportunity that not too many people can, can relate to that um, here, I don't think, but, but what a touching story you've got. Um, learn to pivot your business during a pandemic in, in share with your clients, something that they will hold dear to them and their kids and their kids and their kids will hold dear to them because you're capturing a moment in time of their most treasured things. You know, you've, you've got such a great, you really do. You have a great, a great career story here. What if you had to give somebody some piece of evidence or piece of evidence, piece of advice to someone who may not know what they want to do with their life, who maybe does and is really interested in photography and, um, you know, a career path and something similar to that. What kind of advice would you give somebody? Um, do you have three pieces of advice that you could share with us? Yeah. Um, I, I, uh, 
I'm so grateful to my girlfriend for being so encouraging um, and telling me, you know, quit your day job, we'll make this work. It'll teach you to hustle. I think that something that a lot of, not a lot of, but I've seen a handful of creative solopreneurs in my world do is they have the person that is the major breadwinner. And so even though major breadwinner says, go out, kick some butt, lose your job so that you have to hustle, you still don't have to hustle because you have them. So I think finding some, oh, I'm so sorry about that. It's okay. Uh, finding some way to divorce yourself from the fact that you have that person as well, even if they're supportive. I would say one of two things, either keep your day job and figure out a way to make it work in tandem until it's necessary to separate from that or really find a way to turn off in your brain that you have that family member or that loved one or whatever supporting you. Because I think, not that I loafed around, but what I told the story of as her giving me a kick in the butt didn't kick me in the butt inside as much as I thought it did. And so it took me longer to get off the ground than I thought it would. That, that absolutely makes sense. I got a couple more. Yeah, go ahead. Keep going. Um, uh, okay, and th this one I, I imagine is true of most industries, um, definitely true for those that make images and videos. YouTube University, I don't even know if you need college anymore. YouTube is amazing. The, the information that people share, the, the breakdowns of from behind the scenes and the ways that you can edit to the equipment that you can buy to where you can buy that equipment cheaper. Like it's just unreal how much people are willing to share and how much is already out there. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of, this is kind of like a kick in the butt thing again, it leaves it in your lap. You can continue to educate yourself every day if you want to. Um, and I think that anybody that stagnates, it's tough because it's tempting, but that's kind of on you, which brings me to point three, not just YouTube, find your community in your community. Um, Buffalo photographic community has been amazing to me. Great resource, people sharing contracts, people sharing information about where you can shoot, where you can do it cheaply and just not underestimating how kind people can be and not overestimating how much people are uh, like selfish to keep business for themselves. Yeah. Buffalo, I think is really a great place to, um, connect and, and they are the city of good new neighbors. Like, it, you know, if you need something, all you have to do is ask. And there was, you know, 10 people in line to help you. Like, I just, that's how I feel about it. There is a, um, there's a Buffalo photographic podcast, oh. uh, with a few hosts and one of them calls herself the good neighbor in the city of good neighbors, I believe. Ooh, Lindsay, I'm sorry. <laughs> but like that, that's the whole idea is that she, and she is, she is such a valuable resource and she's so sweet. So yeah. Wow. There's a right. lot. That, that's great. Well, Mark, this has been really great. You have shared, I think, a lot of valuable information. It was so nice to actually finally get to meet with you, to you in person you. Uh, and learn more about what you've done and, and how you've got to where you are today. I, you know, that's my whole mission is to share these kinds of stories because there's a ton of people out there that are, will always find their story in your story. And and knowing that, you know, they can see and, and talk to somebody who has had success is, I think, very powerful. So thank you so much. If someone wants to reach out to you, um, maybe to talk to you about photography or hire you to take pictures of some of their heirlooms or maybe a senior portrait or, you know, a headshot, um, how, how is the best way to reach out to you? Generally, I like email up front just because all the details can get in line in, in one place and then we can keep track of them, which is mthomasduggan uh, at gmail.com. Okay. And I will um, put that in the pod, uh, podcast description so that people can find that very easily. So, so thank you again for your time. I really, I think this was a great, um, a great segment and I loved your stories. I really did. So thank you for your time today. Even on your birthday, thank you for giving your time on your, on your birthday. Uh, it, was a, it was honestly a great way to celebrate a birthday. Kind of, oh, you know, remember, you. remember good days and, you know, um, you've, you've given me a reason to be kind of proud and excited again about what I do.
So thank good, you. good. I'm well, I'm glad I could help. <laughs> uh, thank you everyone for listening to Sharp HR Career Corner. If you are having trouble figuring out what you want to do in your career, or you could use some assistance, reach out to Sharp Human Resources. We would love to help, help you find your way. Uh, please, if you enjoy listening, I encourage you to download the podcast, leave a comment, and share with others that you know. The more downloads, comments, and likes our podcast receives, the better our ratings and the easier we can be found. So thank you in advance for that. Until next time, be kind, everyone. We need to show a lot more kindness in the world, and it starts with you and I. Thanks again for listening, and have a great day. Mm -hmm.